Telemax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Welcome to the show and to a diverse range of topics. Here's what we have coming up for you. Hidden treasures, exploring Europe's largest underwater museum. Chart Toppers, a new illustrated book focuses on one-hit wonders. And Port of Call, a day out in the northern German city of Hamburg. Diving trips usually consist of looking at fish and coral, but not off the coast of Lanzarote. You've just seen a glimpse of the seabed and the vast number of sculptures. These have been lowered 14 metres below the surface of the water. The pieces form a new sculpture park, the latest project by British artist Jason de Carey's Taylor. He's spent the last two years working on the figures and the museum is expected to attract tourists from far and wide. They just need to be able to dive. We're taking a trip to Los Colorados Bay in the south of the Spanish island of Lanzarote to visit a new kind of museum. Its artworks are displayed underwater and these divers were among the first to see them. I've come to Lanzarote a lot in recent years and heard that a museum was being built here. I'm very curious to see what is the result. I'm very happy I can join in for the first dive. Then they take the plunge. 12 to 14 meters below the water surface, they find the museum's 60 sculptures. Many were modeled on residents of Lanzarote. Some make a statement about contemporary society, like this sculpture which shows a faceless couple taking a selfie. May we looking on ourselves, if we, uh, may we be losing the, the ability to experience things. Uh, all we can do is seem to document everything. And so by putting it in this underwater setting and uh, putting it with other artworks, it's kind of, we've removed ourselves from actually living life. Instead, we're just recording life. And I kind of wanted to sort of maybe give the viewer this idea that we're kind of losing a part of ourselves in, in the process. Jason de Caris Taylor has been living on Lanzarote since 2014. The British artist produces his sculptures in his studio beside the bay. Some are portraits or statues that stand on their own, but others are large ensemble pieces. Raft of Lampedusa pays homage to the refugees who died crossing the Mediterranean. All the people that are, are coming to Europe, you know, they're, they're, they're coming because they have to. Uh, they have to make a better life for themselves. They have no other option. They're, it's either that or drown, effectively. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to put the emphasis on us, so on our responsibility to try and solve the crisis. The artist's sculptures already adorn many seabeds around the world, like here in Mexico. The art evolves over time as coral and other marine life move in. They're like artworks of conservation. More fundamentally is, is to kind of show us living in this kind of symbiotic relationship in a, in a kind of a better balance with nature. Instead of us sort of dominating the landscape, we are actually being colonized and, and maybe absorbed back into the, into the planet. The first sculptures were submerged here at the start of February 2016. Nature will eventually make its mark on them too. But in cold water like this, even Jason Lacaris can't predict what will happen over the next few years. The Atlantic Ocean is just really, really interesting. It's this incredibly deep sort of blue, which I haven't witnessed in, in other parts I've worked. And it really gives the whole sort of museum a different look, kind of otherworldly feeling to it, almost ghostly like appearance. The museum is sure to become another tourist magnet for the island. What I'd really like is for the tourists who come to Lanzarote to get more out of their experience, richer, different, more beautiful. This will improve their experience and, of course, it will benefit the economy. The 
the first guests enjoyed their visit to the Museo Atlantico. Diving schools are now hoping they'll be followed by many more visitors. It just brings something totally new and all the dive schools will be able to take their customers there. Of course, they need to be accredited and have their eco guides which go there. This will bring business, it will, be, it will create jobs and it will just bring uh, more income for the whole island. The underwater museum won't be complete until January 2017. By then, another 300 artworks will have been installed on the ocean floor. Now, everybody knows the songs Kung Fu Fighting, Live is Life and Macarena. These are hits that are famous chart toppers, but unfortunately for the artists, not many people know their other songs. Their one hit wonders, though, will never die, and a number of these, spanning the decades, have been put together in this illustrated book. I tell you what, it's hard to look through it without wanting to sing the songs, I can tell you. Everybody knows these hits. Everybody was coming. They topped the charts for weeks, the world over. Mumbo number five. But that was that, and the musicians never managed to land a second hit. The phenomenon of the one-hit wonders caught the imagination of Carolyn Lubert, an illustrator based in Hamburg. They just capture the spirit of their time. They perfectly fit the musical fashion of the moment. The songs were well produced, and the performances were good and authentic. Lerbert decided to put together a book on the subject, with texts by journalist Marcus Lucas. They picked out some of the best stories of the musical Flash in the Pan. The selection process was far from easy. The book could easily have been twice as long, but the publisher said 80 pages is about right. We only chose artists who had one international hit. That was one of the criteria. Lebert creates illustrations for magazines and newspapers. For the book, she drew 60 years of one-hit wonders. One of the earliest is from 1958, Domenico Modugno, with Nel Blu del Pinto di Blu, also known as Volare. Volare. It sold 20 million copies. Lerbert is particularly fond of vintage one-offs. Like Louie Louie by the Kingsman. The 50s and 60s boasted lots of one-hit wonders. In the rock and roll era, loads of musicians suddenly emerged and had songs released because rock and roll was really hot. So many hit the big time with a single song but never followed it up. There was an incredible number of artists making music at the time. The book also tells the stories behind the songs. Live is Life by the Austrian band Opus is a love song addressed to their fans. It was recorded at a concert in 1984. This is Mambo number five. A little bit of Monica. Mambo number five by Lou Bega dates from 1999. It's an old tune with a new libretto in rap form, and it sees him listing his former girlfriends. It was number one in 22 countries, but it remained Bega's only hit. For some, the single hit was a curse, for others, a blessing. 
It was a curse for those who got stuck in a certain musical niche but wanted to move on and do other things while everybody focused on their one-hit song. It was a blessing for those who wanted a nice income. These two elderly gents are probably still receiving a tidy sum in royalties for Macarena. Lerbert set out to convey the mood, the feel of a song. That meant listening to each closely, at least to start with. I didn't listen to them all the time while I was drawing. I watched the videos once as I was doing some sketches, but any more might have proved destructive if you listen to them over and over. Her antidote was to listen to classical music. Because it has to be said, some one-hit wonders could stick with you forever. Da, da, da. This year has already seen Fashion Week in London, Milan and also Paris. And something that everyone seems to be talking about, apart from the clothes on the catwalk, of course, is ready to buy. What is that? Well, it's where customers will be able to purchase some items seen on the runway straight after the show. Now, designers are used to working a season ahead, so the manufacturers have time to produce the items before they appear in the store. So, these new buzzwords are putting an enormous pressure on the industry and causing a lot of controversy. Ads for Paco Rabanne are all over Paris. For the first time, the fashion house decided to sell items from its latest collection right after its fashion show, and not, as has been the case so far, many months later. The idea is to boost sales. Ready to buy is the buzzword in the fashion industry right now, a controversial topic it seems. I do think that there is a case to be argued to have uh, clothes, accessories available directly after the show, so the customer who's now used to seeing everything right away on her, her phone or on a computer can buy things if she uh, wished to. but. I really feel it's a question of each designer and house examining uh, their needs and their, the possibilities of what works for them. Others want to stick with tradition. Bretta Porte is an established part of the industry with its own show since the 1950s. Fashion houses including Dior and Chanel are skeptical about the see now, buy now concept. It may sound simple, but it's not. It has to do with the way the labels manufacture and distribute their clothes. You can't just turn the fashion industry on its head. I really love the quality of clothes. I really like clothes for a, like an icon pieces. What I like collecting clothes, then I prefer to wait in six months to have incredible pieces of clothing then because it's so difficult to do perfect clothes in a short way. But while the others are still weighing up the pros and cons, Paco Rabanne has taken the lead. These outfits became available for purchase right after the show via its website and its newly opened boutique. Julien Doucenard has been creative director since August 2013. He's just 33 and represents a younger generation who are shaking up the world of fashion. I like it when things go fast. I like the immediacy of buying a dress right after a show. I think customers should be able to see clothes at the same time as the journalists and purchase them. There's a kind of nexus of desire between the show and the boutique. What matters ultimately is that people come to the store, like the clothes and buy them. At the new boutique on Rue Cambon, the very latest designs are on show. But shoppers may not have got the message yet. And of course, luxury does not come cheap. This coat costs 5,500 euros. The jeans, 590. The idea of ready to buy throws up a lot of questions. 
For example, will it apply to individual items or to entire collections? And might it mean reorganizing the entire fashion calendar? It's important that everybody thinks very seriously about having clothes that are delivered into the department stores, into the boutiques or online that are applicable to each season. I think the idea of delivering fur coats in May and very lightweight clothes in the middle of, of winter is also something that needs to be looked at. I, I think it makes much more sense to deliver more clothes more often. The industry may be in for quite an upheaval, and it seems likely that the revolutionaries will eventually win. Fashion cycles are spinning ever faster, and if you snooze, you may well lose. Well, we all hate losing, don't we? Especially football fans. But for those who want to relive some of the best moments of the beautiful game, they can head off to a museum dedicated entirely to the sport. We visited two of the most popular ones here in Europe. The outside may be grey and drab, but inside, the colourful world of football comes to life. The museum is spread over three floors of a former bank in downtown Zurich. For exhibition organizer Lutz Engelke, the greatest challenge was how to convey all the powerful emotions linked to football within the rigid walls of a static museum. We brought movement in through media. As you saw downstairs in the foyer, we have an almost 240-degree wall of screens on the one side. Then we've frozen football in time with individual scenes. The museum is a mix of acceleration and deceleration. At the center of the museum is a rainbow of football jerseys from all 209 member associations of FIFA, complete with video content for each shirt. The original FIFA World Cup trophy is one of the highlights of the collection. Germany's football museum, by contrast, only has a replica of the trophy in bronze. Unlike the FIFA exhibition building, the one in Dortmund was designed to be a museum, so Lutz Engelke had more freedom there to experiment. After passing through the Players' Tunnel, the tour begins with a room dedicated to Germany's first World Cup victory in 1954. It's designed to be an experience almost as real as on the pitch. So you can warm up on the forecourt. Then you go through the players' tunnel and onto the pitch. And on the pitch, that's where the decisive action takes place, as Zepp Herberger said when Germany won the World Cup shortly after the Second World War. The Dortmund Museum focuses heavily on Germany's four World Cup victories between 1954 and 2014. Dates and numbers turn into entire stories that can be experienced with all the senses. Lutz Engelke spent five years working on the project with his agency Triad, which develops designs for trade fairs and theme parks all over the world. Triad worked with filmmakers, architects, designers and carpenters for the German Football Museum. It all started with an idea, sketched on good old-fashioned paper. When you've decided to create a whole new format, not just a museum with objects inside showcases, but a drama, a composition that's never been seen before, then you really start to dream. This is the Hall of Fame. The basic statement behind it is that a star is born out of a team of 11 players. And so these 11 players are on the wall with a kind of golden shadow. And from these 11 players, or a thousand national players altogether, individual heroes are cut out and have their sculpture in the Hall of Fame shown with their own biography. German footballers helped develop the museum by donating a number of exhibits. Shoes worn when Germany won the European Cup in 1996 were donated by Oliver Bierhoff. The shoes are special, not because I wore them, but because it was a special moment. 
You can really imagine yourself there. I think it's great. It triggers so many emotions over the things that have happened in German football. The process of creating a museum like this and talking to the footballers who were at the center of it all, that's what makes it all so special. Back to Zurich. Football is fascinating. That's the message that the new FIFA museum is looking to convey to visitors. First of all, we want people to have fun. And second, we want them to realize that FIFA is about more than just the scandal of recent years. All this has grown up over 50, 60, 70 years. Without the FIFA rules, world football wouldn't exist. And here you can see how a ball brings entire peoples together. Perhaps individual FIFA members will also take time to visit the museum and to reflect on the original spirit behind the beautiful game. Germans are real football fans, of course, and we're now going to feature the country's second largest city. It's located in the north of the country, and it takes eight to nine hours to get there from the North Sea by boat. Trading by sea used to bring the most income into the city, but now there are lots of other reasons that people flock there too. And where is there? Well, it's of course Hamburg. For over 800 years, Hamburg's harbour has been a gateway to the world. Tens of thousands of ships make their way in and out of the port every year, but the harbor is also home to local ferries that transport residents and visitors alike up and down the Elba. It's a great way to take in the fascinating mix of architectural styles along the waterway. The St. Pauli Piers are among Hamburg's most famous landmarks. It's also a great place to grab a snack. It's nice to just sit here out of the wind, relax and enjoy the view of the harbour. Quite the life. I'm retired, so I come to Hamburg quite often. I've grown to love it. I like to spend a lot of time walking around the harbour district. The historical warehouse district is located just south of the port. The 19th century buildings used to store coffee and other goods. Now they serve as exclusive office space. This is also where the International Maritime Museum is located. 3,000 years of seafaring history are documented here. One of its jewels is a model of Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria, made from pure gold. We have an incredible number of ship models here that are extremely important for us. Among them are those made of skeletons. They were made by French and Spanish prisoners of war who were captured by the English during the Napoleonic Wars. These model ships are made under extremely difficult circumstances, but are works of art that are in a class of their own. Also in a class of their own are these rare seascapes by 20th century Hamburg artist Johannes Holst. Another attraction in the warehouse district is the world's biggest model railroad exhibition, created and run by twin brothers and Hamburg natives Garrett and Frederick Brown. It features the city's main landmarks, including the new concert hall on the banks of the Elbe. The residents of Hamburg are known for their reserved manner, but locals say when the ice thaws, long-lasting friendships begin. There's a reason why we say here in Hamburg that a handshake is a valid agreement, one you can count on. When locals have decided on something, or to work with someone, or enter a new friendship, they make a commitment. This is all because we like to keep our distance. The Alsta Lake is fed by the Elbe. It's also a stone's throw away from the historic town hall and exclusive shopping district. With architecture that reflects the Venetian style, the Alsta Arcade with its boutiques and cafes is a popular destination for both tourists and residents. And a trip to Hamburg wouldn't be complete without a visit to the famous Atlantic Hotel, built in 1909. Its chefs uphold a culinary tradition. 
lobster soup, a specialty of the house for over 100 years. We take a good product and we try not to change it too much. Instead, we try to make it even better with a few nuances. Hamburg, Germany's second largest city, where a rich past mixes with a modern present on the banks of the Elbe. How nicely put. But now from the largest city in the country, Berlin, it's time to wrap things up for today. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your day and until next time, goodbye.